All right, welcome back to Rock the JVM's Scala at Lightspeed. I'm Daniel, and in this video, we will discuss some of the advanced Scala features that you will probably see in real life. All right, so I'm going to go back to the project that we started at the beginning of the series. If you're new to this video series, go back to the first video where we set up the initial files. Now, specifically for this video, I'm going to create a new Scala application. So under the com.rockthejvm package, I'm going to select new Scala class. I'm going to name this advanced. I'm going to make it an object as before, and I'm going to have it extend app so that we can run it on our computer as a standalone application. You can also test this code yourself. Now, the very first thing that I want to show you in this suite of advanced Scala features is lazy evaluation. Lazy evaluation means that an expression is not evaluated until it's first used. Let me give you an example. If I define a lazy val, let's call this a lazy value, and I give it a value of two, the number two is not associated to a lazy value until it's used for the first time. And this can be illustrated with a side effect. So I'm going to create a lazy val. Let's call this lazy value with side effect as being, and I'm going to open and close some curly braces, this meaning I'm going to uh, set up a code block. And as you learned before, a code block is an expression whose value is the value of the last expression. So I'm going to print line, for example, I am so very lazy. And at the end, I'm going to return the value 42 or 43 or something like that, a value. Now, as you learned at the beginning of the series, this being a code block, has the value of 43 because it's the last expression to be evaluated. Now, if I run this application as a standalone application, nothing will be actually printed to the console, as you can see over here, except this IDE related stuff. If I take out the lazy modifier, if I run this application, I'm going to see I am so very lazy. That is because this code block was evaluated and it was attributed to the lazy value with side effect name. Now, the lazy value is evaluated when it's first used. So if I define a small value, let's call this eager value, as lazy value with side effect plus one, even though I'm not printing something out to the console myself, because I'm using lazy value with side effect for the first time, this code block will actually get evaluated. So if I run this application, I'm still going to see I am so very lazy. That is because lazy value with side effect was evaluated because it was used here in this other value. So I hope this makes sense. Lazy evaluation is useful in infinite collections and in some more rare use cases. The second advanced bit that I'm going to show you is, let's call them pseudo collections. Although they are not collections, they are their own types, but you can think of them as collections. And in particular, I'm referring to the option type and the try type. Let's call this pseudo collections in between air quotes so that we understand that option and try are their own types. They're not collections themselves. What do I mean by that? Option and try are very useful in some use cases in large code bases when you have unsafe methods. Let me define an unsafe method. Let's call this method which can return null. Taking no arguments and we declare that this method returns a string and it might return a string or it might return null. Let's say it returns a string, let's say hello Scala. This is a valid string but in large code bases when you don't have the time or you actually cannot read the implementation of a method, all you can do is hope that you will get an actual string. But to guard yourself against nulls, you would have to do if method which can return null is actually equal to null, and then you can do some defensive code against null which is what we normally do in other languages like C++ or Java because null pointer exceptions or segmentation faults can actually wreak havoc through our code. But in Scala, we don't have to do that if we use the option type. So let me give you an example. Let's define an option as option from Scala. So option applied to 
method which can return null. You can think of an option as a kind of like a collection of one element at most. So a collection between air quotes which contains at most one element. If this method returns a valid value, then this collection, so to speak, contains the value inside. So this will be a sum with hello Scala. This is the subtype of the option abstract type. If the method which can return null actually returns null, the value here will be none. So sum with a value or none, which is a singleton object. None means the equivalent of null, except this is a regular value, so there's no risk in accessing illegal members or methods. If you know pattern matching from the previous video, you will be able to understand the following code. We can say val, let's call this uh, string processing or string processed or something like that. You can pattern match this option, so you can say an option match, and you can add a case for some string and you can return whatever you like for example I have obtained a valid string and you can inject the string inside or in case you get a none which is the singleton object of course deriving from option you can say I obtained nothing so notice that there are no null checks that you would normally add for defensive code in other programming languages. So all you have to do is to wrap your unsafe code in an option and then do a pattern match on it. Or you can operate with options like you would on collections with map, flat map, and filter. If you remember these functions, we discussed them on lists earlier in the video series. So this was option which guards against needing to check for nulls. There is another special pseudo collection, so to speak, that we call try. And uh, this guards against methods which can throw exceptions. So let me define an unsafe method. I'm going to call this method which can throw exception. I'm declaring that this method can return a string, but in fact I can throw new runtime exception. Exceptions are really bad for JVM programs like Scala programs or Java programs because they can interrupt or essentially break everything. And so we need to guard against exceptions with what you saw earlier with try catches. So normally we would say try and then inside the try block we would say method which can throw exception and, and then we would catch all the exceptions that we like. So we can have case E call an exception and then we would defend against this evil exception. Adding many layers of this will lead to very defensive code, adding complexity to large code bases and making code almost unreadable, which is why Scala uses the try so-called pseudo collection in the following way. Let me define a try as try with the capital T. This is from Scala Util. And try can wrap something that can throw an exception. So method which can throw exception. And this is a try object containing either a string, if the method went correctly, or it can contain the exception that was thrown. So try will uh, essentially swallow the exception that might be thrown and wrap it in a regular value. So a try is a quote unquote collection with either a value if the code went well, or an exception if the code threw one. And you can pattern match a try object in much the same way as we did with an option. For example, let's call this another string processing as a try match. And we can match against the two subtypes of try, which are success. So have success that I need to import from Scala Util containing a valid value. And I can say I have obtained a valid string and I can inject the valid value inside or we can have a case for failure and I need to import failure from Scala Util. 
and the failure will contain an exception and uh, we can process that exception around. We can log it, we can do whatever you want. So I have obtained an exception and I can inject that inside. All right, so we use tries to avoid defensiveness with try catches. Instead, we process tries like we would on normal values. The try object and the option object can be processed like we did with collections. So both try and option have the map, flat map, and filter compositional functions alongside some others that I'm not going to talk about in this video. All right, so I'm actually going to add some green comments here so that you can separate the sections much more easily. So I'm going to add some documentation comments here. So we have lazy evaluation and pseudo collections. Let me tell you another thing. Let me tell you how to evaluate something on another thread. In other words, asynchronous programming. This is done with another quote-unquote pseudo collection known as a future. So let me define a val called a future as future, which I will import from Scala Concurrent. So I'm going to double click here. And to the constructor of future, I'm going to pass a code block. So this expression will be actually evaluated on another thread. Let's say print line loading with suspension points, then let's do a thread sleep with 1000 milliseconds. This call is uh, very familiar for you Java programmers. Thread.sleep will actually block the running thread by one second, so 1000 milliseconds. Then let me print line, I have computed a value. And let me return the value, let's say 67. Now, in order to run a future, we will need to import an execution context, which I'm going to import above. So right at the very top of the file, I'm going to import the following Scala dot concurrent dot execution context with a capital E. So execution context dot implicits with a capital I and then global. I'm going to discuss implicits later in this video shortly. So in a couple of minutes. Now, if you import this value, then notice that the compiler is now happy that this global value is available to run this future. The global value is the equivalent of a thread pool, that is a collection of threads on which we can schedule the evaluation of this expression. So if we run this application, we will see both the I'm so very lazy and loading, but the main thread of the JVM, the main thread of the application, finished before this future had the chance to evaluate. That is a proof that this future, the uh, block that I put here under the constructor of the future, was actually evaluated on another thread. If I do thread sleep for two seconds here under the main JVM thread, the main application thread, then this feature will also have the chance to evaluate. Look at that, I have computed a value. Now, two things to mention here about the future. Notice the syntax. The future is actually future.apply, as you have seen in other instances throughout the rest of this mini course. Now, in uh, real life code bases, we actually omit the parentheses over here because this block will be passed as an argument to the future apply method. So that was one thing. The second thing is that the future is a quote unquote collection. So you can think of a future as a collection which contains a value when it's evaluated. So at the point when this uh, code block is evaluated, this quote unquote collection will actually contain a value. Until then, it does not contain any value. But a future is composable with map, flat map, and filter in much the same way as we did with the other co collections and pseudo collections in this application. So we talked about pseudo collections that we named in between air quotes in very theoretical terms. The future try and option types are called monads. 
in functional programming. Monads are a very touchy subject in functional programming because they are very, 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 quite very abstract and very hard to explain. A lot of people have tried explaining what monads are, but for now, just don't think about it. Think of future try and option as some sort of a collection. Now, the final thing that I'm going to show you in this video is implicits. Implicits are one of the most powerful features of the Scala compiler because they allow for some magic that you wouldn't have thought possible. There are two common use cases for using implicits. Use case number one is implicit arguments. So if I define a method with implicit args, and this takes an implicit, this is a keyword, implicit value, let's call this implicit arg as an int, and returns, let's say, arg plus one, then if I define an implicit val, let's call this my implicit int as equal let's say 46, then I can print line, for example, a method with implicit args without passing any arguments. That is because the compiler figures out that the method takes an implicit argument and tries to find a value of type int that it can inject here as an argument. So the compiler actually does a method with implicit arguments with my implicit int which is 46, and this method will return 47. Good. So this was the first use case with implicit arguments. I think this is pretty sensible. The second use case, which is much more magical, is implicit conversions. So let me give you an example. Usually we do implicit conversions to add methods to existing types over which we don't have any control over the code. So I'm going to define an implicit class so an implicit class that I'm going to call my rich integer, which takes as constructor arguments an int, let's call this n. And this class has a method is even, which takes no arguments. And the return value of this function is whether n mod 2 is equal to 0. All right. So what I've done here is I've wrapped an integer into a class that I called my rich integer. And this my rich integer has a single method called is even, which returns true if this wrapped int is actually even. So n mod 2 is equal to 0. Now, watch what I'm writing. I can say the number 23 dot is even in this case, even though the is even method does not belong to the int class. So if I remove the implicit modifier for this class, notice that this code turns red because the method is not available for the int type. But if I do implicit class my rich integer, the compiler is smart enough to figure out, okay, this code does not normally compile. Let me find an implicit wrapper over this value over here, which is an int. Maybe I can find one and maybe, just maybe, that class has an is even method. So the compiler is kind enough to do new my rich integer with the number 23 and then call the is even method on that. This is pretty magical because it makes Scala an incredibly expressive language, but this is also dangerous. So use implicits with very, very much care. All right, so the Scala at Lightspeed mini course has come to an end. I'm Daniel for Rock the JVM, and I hope this was useful and fun. I will be waiting for you in the other Rock the JVM courses, and until next time, thank you for watching. <laughs>